Well, brethren, please turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. And we're just going to read one verse here in 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, a verse we're very familiar with in the Church of God. We quote it and paraphrase it very often, I believe. But it is a very important verse about what Christianity is all about. Here in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, we read, Paul write this, these words, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now, when we focus on this verse, we usually focus on the second half, imitating Christ. And we use that to show that Christianity is all about imitating Jesus Christ, walking as he walked. But I want to focus on a different part of the verse today. I want to focus on the first part of the verse, the part we usually don't emphasize quite as much, where Paul says, imitate me. Stop there. Let's let's, let's put the period there for a second. Imitate me. Paul was actually telling the Corinthians, imitate me, imitate my life as I imitate Christ. He was telling the Corinthians and us today that his life could be used as an example of someone who was striving to imitate Jesus Christ. He was striving to live his life as a reflection of Christ. Was it a perfect reflection? Of course not. He would be the first to tell us that. But it was a reasonably solid reflection that the Corinthian brethren and us today can look at to learn about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Brethren, the Apostle Paul was one of the most remarkable men to ever walk this earth. He was used by God to write 13, possibly 14, of the books of the New Testament. He was a zealous preacher of the gospel of the kingdom of God. He took the gospel to the Gentile world, and God used him to elaborate and explain some of the most foundational concepts and doctrines of Christianity throughout his writings. But brethren, his life wasn't always a perfect reflection of Jesus Christ, and that's a part of his story that I believe we can learn from as well. He is an example of a very flawed man, a sinner in many ways, who God used in a powerful way. And in many ways, his story is our story. His calling in Christian life and his example was a template for our calling in Christian life in many ways. I believe as we look at Paul, we'll be able to see not just Paul's story, but our story in his experiences, in his life. Though his experiences may have been more dramatic than ours, he experienced the same calling and the same challenges that every one of us face and will face in the future. In many ways, his experiences make him one of the most relatable personalities in the entire Bible. So brethren, let's explore some lessons we can learn today from the life of this incredible individual, the Apostle Paul. The title today is Follow Paul as He Followed Christ. If you like simple titles, you can just say lessons from the Apostle Paul. But follow Paul as he followed Christ. Let's first look at a little bit about Paul's background. Who was this man? Instead of starting to the man, at the man Paul became, let's start at the man he was at the beginning. Let's first go all the way back to his early life to see what we can learn. Of course, oftentimes we'll be referring to him by his Jewish name, Saul. Later in life, he primarily went by his Latin name, his Roman name, Paul. Sometimes we may think, well, his name was changed by God. No, they were both his name from birth. Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Latin name. Later in his life, as he went to the Gentiles, he primarily went by that Latin name. But a lot of times we'll see him referred to as Saul. Let's go back to Acts 22, verse 3. Acts 22, verse 3, and we'll see a little bit of introductory material about this individual, the Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, as we will see. At this point, he was known as the Saul of, as Saul of Tarsus. Acts 22, and we'll look in verse 3. We're going to break into the context a bit, but it stands alone. Paul is talking about himself here, identifying himself. He writes here in Acts 22, verse 3, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, he was talking about the city of Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the laws of our father, the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are to this day. 
So first, he identifies himself as coming from Tarsus. So he, didn't, he wasn't born and didn't necessarily grow up in Jerusalem. He was, he was born and, and came of age, at least to a point, in this city called Tarsus, which was in Asia Minor, uh, somewhere in southeast, uh, southeast Turkey. I could have shown a map, but I didn't do that. Now, Tarsus was an interesting place. It was the capital city of Cilicia, and it was known for being a place rich in education, uh, and you could get a very good education in Greek philosophy and history and language there. But it wasn't necessarily a place like Athens where people would travel to to study. Usually the locals would study there and then go off to further pursue studies at another place. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. We see he says here that he was brought up in this city, in the city of Jerusalem. So at some point in his childhood, he was taken down to Jerusalem to study at the feet of this pharisaical leader, this Pharisee named Gamaliel. Now he says he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Who was this person? Well, he was a well-known pharisaic rabbi at that time in the first century, and it's believed that he was a grandson of the even more famous rabbi Hillel. You've probably heard the name Hillel. He was a specialist in the Jewish law, and his name is even mentioned by Josephus and in the Mishnah itself. But what's interesting about Gamaliel, when you look a little bit at him, you would think, well, Paul becoming the man he was, this ultra-conservative, violent Pharisee, you would think that was Gamaliel and that Gamaliel taught that to him. But from what we know about Gamaliel, he was actually more of a moderate Pharisee. He was not the strictest version on the Pharisaical spectrum. He was more, more a moderate. Still, compared to us, he'd be very rigid and, and conservative in a sense. But on the pharisaical spectrum, he was known more of a moderate. In fact, we read about him in Acts chapter 5, and there he's, we see him as a person practicing moderation. It's when they had arrested Peter, Peter and the disciples, and, uh, and he, he, he tells the group, he says, you know, don't kill them. You know, let them go. If, if what they're doing is not of God, it will come to nothing. If what they're doing is of God, you can't stop it. So he had a very reasonable approach at that time, not what you would consider a hardliner. His student, though, on the other hand, Saul, was a little bit different. And so it seems that seems at some point Saul developed into a much more kind of radical version, uh, went past Gamaliel in some ways, a little more zealous, a little more strict. That's how he describes himself in Philippians 3. Let's go there. Philippians chapter 3. He gives some more background information on himself here. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll look at verses 5 and 6. Break into the context here. Here he says, he's, he's talking about his background in Judaism. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, it's interesting that he identifies himself as a Benjamite because his name was the name of the most prominent king uh, of Benjamin Saul, uh, the first king of, of Israel, who was also a Benjamite. So it seemed he may have been named after King Saul. But here he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, this is human righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He was strict. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He, was, he, he describes himself as strict as you could possibly be, and he was willing to use physical violence to defend those beliefs. And he says here he had a form of righteousness based on the traditions of his religion. It wasn't necessarily God's righteousness at this point. We won't read it, but in Acts 26, verse 5, he describes himself as being part of the strictest party of Judaism at his time. He was one of the strictest enforcers of the oral law, of the traditions that there was. So with this as background, let's now break into the story and see where Paul enters the scene in the New Testament. And to do that, we'll go to the book of Acts, chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse 58. Acts chapter 7, verse 58, we're introduced to Saul of Tarsus, and it's not a very flattering introduction. He doesn't leave a great impression at the start. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. 
We're breaking into the context of Stephen being on trial and facing these false accusations. Verse 58, and they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. They, they executed him. They killed him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You know, he was, he was about to die, and he was commending the spirit and man back to God. Verse 60, then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. What an incredible example of outgoing concern. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen is a wonderful example there, but Paul, Saul, on the other hand, is not. So here we see they were laying their garments, their clothes, at the feet of Saul. We don't know exactly why they were doing this, but it seems he was guarding the garments of the people who were the false witnesses who were going to stone them. So he was a part of this in some way. Maybe he was the main instigator, the main person who put these people up against Stephen. And then he protected their garments as they went off and did the dirty deed of stoning an innocent man. He was definitely a part of this. He was clearly in some leadership position. He may have been, again, the one who set up the false witnesses in the first place, which means he was willing to lie, bear false witness, promote a false story to get what he wanted. So here we see the zealous Pharisee being a part of the murder of one of the early leaders of the Church of God. We get more details about his part in Stephen's death in Acts chapter 8. Let's just go down to the next chapter. Acts chapter 8, we see a little bit more. He was more involved than what we see in Acts chapter 7. It says, Acts 8 verse 1, now Saul was consenting to his death. Now, when we think of the word consenting, we just think, okay, he was maybe partial. He, he agreed with it, but maybe he wasn't really an active part in it. But that's really not what the Greek reflects. The Greek word actually reflects and means to be pleased with or to take pleasure in. So you could read that, and now Saul was taking pleasure in his death. He was very much a part of it. And it seems that using that word, he was not just doing it because he felt he had to do it. He felt it was the right thing for his religion. He was enjoying it. He was relishing it. This was something that he was actively a part of and, and uh, in a sense, taking pleasure in. He wanted this man dead. And I think this begins to show us the depth of carnality of this man at this point in his life, that he was not just executing a man, but seems to be taking pleasure in it, a, an active part in it. It goes on, at, this, this, at that time a great persecution arose against the church, which is, was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So the actions of Paul was scattering the church all over the place. People were afraid of him. He was a force to be reckoned with. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So here we get a little more information of the, the depth of this man. Havoc, that's an interesting word, another strong word. It's defined as to ravage, to devastate, to ruin, to treat shamefully, a very aggressive form of violence. And it, it just shows us, in one word, the, the cruelty that he must have had. I mean, he was willing to go to great lengths to stamp out this religion, and he had no compunction about violence. He had, he had no, uh, you know, no conscience in that sense of the word in this situation. I mean, we would call these Gestapo tactics. He was going into people's house and pulling out uh, men and women and having them in prison, breaking up families, awful things. What we see is a man who had a very dark side of his character, a man who on the surface looked very religious, a man who on the surface was a very intellectual man, but a man who had a very dark inner nature and character that came out in this situation. You see, the religion Paul believed in, Pharisaic Judaism, as we know from Christ's interaction with them, was heavily focused on external rituals, external behavior. Christ constantly corrected them on that and pointed that out. You know, you, know, you, you're, you look really good on the outside, but you're, you're disgusting on the inside spiritually. And that leads us to lesson one that we can learn about the Apostle Paul. Lesson one, outward actions do not necessarily reflect godly character. That's lesson one. 
Outward actions, or maybe an outward form of righteousness, we could say, do not necessarily reflect godly character. Because on the outside, Paul was considered a religious leader, a doctor of the law, a Pharisee. He spoke excellent Hebrew. He probably knew the the scriptures much better than anybody of us, at least the Old Testament scriptures at that point, better than us. He probably could recite large portions of them. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was extremely zealous and dedicated to his religion. But none of these things changed who he was on the inside. They were just covers for this inner violent nature that came out at this point in his life. You know, it may have came out in different ways that we don't know about, but at least at this point we see this violent, aggressive, hateful nature. And I think that's why later in his writings he emphasizes the heart so much. One of, one of his biographers calls him the apostle, I believe, of the heart set free, F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, and I think he uses that because uh, I think he misinterprets that a little bit, but Paul does emphasize the heart, conversion from the inside, I think, because he understood very intimately what conversion, quote-unquote, on the outside, but not on the inside, was, because he had lived that for a number of years of his life. And that is a lesson for us, that, you know, we can put on a veneer of righteousness on the outside, keep the Sabbath, keep the holy days, tithe, do all the things we're supposed to do, good things, important things, necessary things, but that can still hide a darker inner character, just like Paul doing all the external things of his religion hide a darker inner character that came out in this situation. So lesson one, outward actions do not necessarily reflect godly character. Let's go on now to chapter nine. Chapter nine, and we'll see a little bit more. Another interesting language, looking up these words is very interesting, adds a lot of life to the account. Acts nine, verse one, It says, then Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Breathing, some of the commentators bring out that this this wasn't just something he was doing, this was something coming from deep inside him. He was breathing it out. This This was who he was. This anger, this violence was who he was at the core of his being. You know, he had a a murderous heart. He was breaking the spirit and the letter of the sixth commandment. Verse 2, and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he didn't care, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's about to head up to Damascus to ravage some of the the Christians that had went up there, the church members. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, now we're coming to what's considered the road to Damascus experience. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus up in Syria. It's still there today. And suddenly, a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? A dramatic experience had by a very, very bad man at this point. Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? So he hears this voice, he sees this light. Why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or to kick against the pricks, to offer resistance. I wonder if that means that God had tried to work with him in various circumstances later, uh, earlier in his life, and he was just resisting those circumstances, so he had to knock him down in a very dramatic way to get his attention. I, I don't know exactly why he said that, but he was resisting futilely. God had a purpose for him. He would be diverted toward that purpose. Verse 6, and we see how he, how he uh, responded. This, this represents the turning point of his life right here, the beginning of the turning point. So he, trembling and astonished, he's fearful, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So God's very, Christ is very direct with him. Go to the city and then I'll tell you. You listen to me now. You don't listen to yourself anymore. Listen to me now. Verse 7, And then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Verse 8, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. So he is blinded temporarily for three days. I mean, imagine how scary that is. Imagine that would get your attention to lose your eyesight. That is a scary stuff. Anytime we think of somebody possibly losing their eyesight, that's very serious and scary. And this definitely got his attention. And it was very powerful and dramatic. 
And what's interesting is he's blinded for three days. And that leads us to lesson number two. God's calling occurs by offering light in place of blindness. Light or spiritual vision in place of blindness. That's how he always calls. It may not always be as dramatic as this or as graphic, but that's how he calls people, by giving people spiritual understanding, enlightenment. We sometimes use that phrase for God's calling, enlightenment. Saul had been living his life in blindness, and now God gave him a graphic, Christ gave him a graphic representation of that. You're going to be blind for three days to represent how you've been living your life. Though as a Pharisee, he thought he understood God and he thought he was living in the light, he had to come to the point where he understood, no, I'm blind. I'm, I'm blind and I'm no more righteous than any, anybody else. But it's interesting that Christ revealed himself through light, which, which represents visual sight, seeing. Light helps you see. Conversion begins by seeing. Brethren, sometimes people, even those who grow up in the church, wonder, well, how can I tell if God is calling me? And some of you in this room may be that. Do I, is God calling me? How do I know if God's calling me? I haven't seen a light like this. I haven't been knocked on my knees like this. Well, has God given you spiritual light? Has he given you spiritual vision to see? Do you comprehend? Do you understand his truth, his way of life? If you're starting to comprehend it and make sense, if it's starting to become light, then he probably is calling you. That's how it works. You go from blindness to light, from not being able to see to see. And that's how he calls people in the world. He begins working with them and opening their mind to understand. They see things in a way they never saw them before. So each one of us faces our own personal road to Damascus, Damascus experience, though, in different ways. God uses different ways, different circumstances, different methods for different people. Paul needed this one. But thankfully, we, we don't need this one. We hope we don't need it to be this dramatic. If we grow up in the church, it usually happens much more gradually, but it's still the same process, the same calling. Light replaces blindness and darkness. Let's continue in Acts 9. Acts 9, verse 10. Acts 9, verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus, so here, this is the destination Paul was headed to, and his name was Ananias, a church member. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Obviously, Ananias is, there's red flags going up. That guy, not that guy, he's probably backing up. For behold, he is praying. Verse 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. You know, this guy is, this guy is dangerous. He's a persecutor. He hates us. You want me to go see him? I came, maybe I came up here to get, get away from him. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. He's coming here with a vendetta. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel to, of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And that leads us to lesson number three. Lesson number three, when God calls someone, he always has a reason. God always has a reason. Here it was stated very plainly. God had a reason. He was calling Paul to bear his name to Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. His two greatest gifts were zeal and intelligence, and God was going to use that zeal, redirect those two things into his service. His zeal would be directed towards proclaiming the gospel to the world. His intelligence would be directed towards articulating the truth of God in writing for those generations and future generations. God had a specific purpose for him. Now, of course, not all of us have been called to that same purpose as Saul or Paul. But God has a purpose for calling each and every one of us. And later in his writings in 1 Corinthians, Paul, 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about spiritual gifts and basically makes that, that point, that everybody has been called to contribute to the body of Christ in a certain way. God has a purpose. We may not always see it clearly, but sometimes other people see it more clearly than us, and God certainly sees it. And of course, we don't look at just our calling just from the here and now, just from, well, what am I called to do in the church and in the world now? We also know that he's preparing a place for us in the kingdom, and he's preparing a specific role for us. 
So throughout our life, he's training us, sometimes unknowingly, for something we're going to be asked to do in the future, for a purpose. And Paul's story reiterates that our calling is the same way. We're called for a purpose. God doesn't call people using eeny, meeny, miny, mo. He doesn't go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Okay, I'll call him. Catch a tiger by his toe. Okay, I'll call him. No, he's very selective and intentional. So he's calling everybody that he calls in this room around the world for a specific purpose. In his church now, maybe in a setting example now, and ultimately for a purpose in the kingdom of God that will come in the future. Let's continue in verse 17 here. We're still in Acts chapter 9. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, Paul, he saw, he said, Brother Saul, interesting, he calls him Brother Saul. He is accepting him immediately. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight. Again, it pictures that spiritual sight that he was going to be receiving. And be filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, That is what gives him the spiritual sight. That's what gives us spiritual sight. Verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So here we see the real change, the real change. He commits himself to this. He's baptized. He follows the call. He follows the call. Verse 19, so when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So here we see Paul acts on the calling. He could, have, he could have rejected it. He still had free choice. He could have kept kicking against the goads, but he did act. He was baptized, and he took that step and started moving forward. And every one of us has to, again, take the step, going from the calling to the actual response to the calling, baptism at some point, going from the called to the chosen. Verse 20, let's go down to verse 20. Immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So here we see now he's, instead of persecuting the church, he's preaching the same gospel as the church. He's preaching Jesus Christ as the, as the Messiah. A 180 degree turn, which is what conversion is. He goes from persecuting Christ to preaching Christ. Verse 21, then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? Everybody knew why he was up there. And now here he is preaching the very message he tried to destroy. Verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. You know, he had all that scripture in his mind, and as soon as he was called and the light bulb goes, goes out, he knew, how to, he knew those scriptures and he knew how to use them to proclaim that Christ was the Messiah. And this leads us to lesson four. Lesson four, conversion is a complete change in direction. I know that's basic, very simple, but it's very important that we review that from time to time. And Paul's conversion, his calling, completely changed the course of his life, completely changed the direction. He goes from a violent, angry, hateful man, a man who it says breathed out this kind of hatred, it came from inside him, to a man now dedicated to preaching the true gospel, serving Jesus Christ. Now, it didn't all happen immediately. We read there that he increased all the more in strength. It was gradual in a sense. He grew as he went along. There was, more, there was time that it took to learn and put things together, but he did grow and he did change his life. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4 just to review this. Ephesians chapter 4. It's a good review occasionally for us who are baptized and those who are approaching baptism. Just what is conversion? It's not just accepting a belief system. That's a part of it. But it goes deeper. And Paul here, again, emphasizing the depth of it because he knew what the the opposite was. He knew what it was to be religious on the outside, to go through the motions, but not really be a different person on the inside. He lived that way of life. He knew it very well. So he defines conversion here in some interesting, very powerful language. He was so good at using metaphors and analogies. That's part of the reason God called him. He had that ability. He could use his mind that way. Ephesians 4, verses 21 through 24. If if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, 
concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That's what Paul went through. He put off that old man. He went the other direction, and that's what That's the experience every Christian has to go through. Put off that old man. That old way has to go. We go a different direction. Verse 23, but it has to go deeper than just behavioral modification. People in the world can modify behavior. Sometimes it's a very good thing if if you have various addictions that you need to modify and change. But he's he goes deeper than that. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It goes down to the mind, the heart, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice he says true righteousness and holiness. Again, he had a righteousness and a holiness that came from another belief system. It came from his own ideas, and it came from something else. But he was saying, no, it has to be true righteousness and holiness, the holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's where his righteousness came from. So conversion wasn't just modifying his behavior, it was changing his heart and his life and his mind. He stopped doing the things he was doing, but he also had to change the heart. He had to deal with the inner carnality of his nature. He had to renew his mind, and that's what we all have to do. We all go through the same basic Christian process, the same process of conversion. Again, maybe a little less dramatic than Paul, but it's the same process. Our life is in his life. We can follow him in these ways as he followed Christ. Now, sometimes when we change, and especially if we have a lot of baggage in our past, sometimes the worst judge of ourself is not other people. And we actually saw the church, after a period of time, accepted him pretty, pretty readily. Sometimes the worst judge of our past is ourselves. For some who are called and baptized, it can be a struggle to put the guilt of their past life behind them and truly move forward from it. And if we struggle with that, in this room possibly, if, you, if there are just things you're holding on to that you, know, you just feel guilty, did, did I, can I really be forgiven of those things? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Well, the Apostle Paul dealt with that too. 1 Corinthians 15 He makes a number of statements through this, but we'll focus on a couple here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. Again, breaking into the thought. 1 Corinthians 15 is a a really complicated, well, it's not too complicated, but there's a lot of material there. But look look at what he says here in verse 8. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as as by one born out of due time. He came a little bit later than the rest of the apostles. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And I think he was saying this from the heart. I think that's, this is what he struggled with. He really felt this in some ways. Now consider that the book of 1 Corinthians was written about the mid-50s AD. Paul was probably called around the year 35 AD. So we're talking 20 years has passed since he was called. You know, you just think from, from when 9-11 happened to now, that was as much time had passed since his road to Damascus experience and his conversion to now. And he's still saying, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, let alone a Christian probably. It still weighed on him, it haunted him. He carried it with him. You know, we human beings just, we do not have the capacity to fully forget our past sins in the way that God can. God has the power to not call to mind our sins, to put them away. For us, we have to struggle with it. And that was something Paul struggled with the guilt of what he had done. Possibly he had to minister to and preach to the families whose father or mother he had imprisoned or been responsible for killing. Maybe he knew some of Stephen's families, and I'm sure that bothered him every time he had to see those people. It was a reminder of where he came from. Which leads us to lesson five. Despite lingering guilt, we must believe and accept God's forgiveness. Despite lingering guilt, we have to believe and accept God's forgiveness. It can take years to get past the guilt, and that may not completely go away, but we have to believe it. We have to intellectually believe in God's forgiveness and move forward knowing that. Sometimes there are people who never get baptized because they come to the point where they feel that it's not possible that their particular sins could be washed away by baptism. There's no way God could forgive me. And some people, even who are baptized and come to the church, sometimes fall away because those sins and the the guilt comes back and they, well, God really couldn't have forgiven me. He really couldn't have possibly forgiven me of that. And in a sense, they disbelieve what God says he will do 
But Paul is an example of a man who didn't let his guilt cause him to go there. He did not allow, allow his guilt to cause him to be handcuffed or to, to go backwards or to become spiritually paralyzed, to not move forward. 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 1, verse 13. Here we say, here we see that Paul actually said there was a purpose for this, and it's a purpose to encourage us today. You know, he was on the pretty far end of the carnality spectrum, but he was able to be forgiven and to turn around. And that lesson resounds for people today and all time, again, seeing our life in his life. Verse 13, 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, although I was formerly a blasphemer, this is further along in history, he still remembers it and talks about it. I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was an insolent man, I was a very, very evil man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Again, this is another way his life is a testimony to us today. He came to save sinners. I am the, the number one of, those, of that group. Verse 16, however, for this reason I obtain mercy. This reason that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long-suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. It was a pattern, it's an example, again, seeing our story and his story. If God could forgive him and he could accept that forgiveness and change his life and move forward, we can do the same thing. Paul remembered what he had done. He had the lingering guilt, but he moved forward despite it. He didn't let it hold him back. He struggled and he fought with that, yes, till the day he died, but it didn't keep him from moving forward. He may remain faithful and steadfast to the end. And that leads us to our sixth point. Lesson six that we'll look at from the Apostle Paul, we must be consistent and faithful to the end. We must be consistent and faithful to the end. This was the last way that we'll look at today that we follow Paul as he followed Christ. Being steadfast, which means to be faithful and consistent, is one of the most important qualities of a Christian. And Paul set a fine example in that. Let's look at 2 Timothy, our last scripture today. 2 Timothy 4, very familiar words. But we'll see Paul at the end of his life. And he could have confidence that he had done this. He had remained steadfast. You know, sometimes the people who get the most attention in the church are maybe the flashy people who, you know, are in charge of activities, who, you know, are able to speak, who are able to do, you know, things, you know, who knows, out front. But, you know, the really impressive people in the church are the steadfast people, the one who, you know, who, who trod the Christian life till, from day one till the day they die and are consistent and steadfast. Those are the really impressive people. And th that's the kind of people we need to strive to be. Second Timothy. That's what Paul was. This is him at the end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. I'm about to die. I, I'm, he's coming to the end. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's perseverance. That's steadfastness. That's consistency. And he could say that. And he could look at verse 8 and see the vision. What, was, what drove him forward? He wasn't handcuffed by the past. He wasn't locked there. He was driven by the vision of verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but those who have loved his appearing. Again, fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Those aren't platitudes. That is an example of what steadfast is. Diligent, consistent Christianity. We may not have had the dramatic calling and the dramatic um, life that Paul had, but we can follow his example in the way that he lived, steadfast, consistent, dedicated, faithful. Brethren, there's so much more we could explore about the Apostle Paul's life. He was one of the most interesting and intelligent human beings that God ever worked with. His writings provide us so much insight into understanding God's way of life. Today we've just examined a, few, examined a few snapshots from his life and his example. And hopefully through those snapshots, we can see our life and our calling through his life, through the prism of his calling. 
and follow the example he left us. We saw how he started out as a very unconverted and carnal man, not a nice person at all, but he was called and left that way of life. Like us, we all start there at different ends of the carnality spectrum, but we have to leave that behind. We saw that he responded to God's calling and made a complete U-turn. He repented and he changed. And we also must respond to God's calling and repent and change, live and think differently. We saw that he struggled with a sense of guilt throughout his life because of the things he had done, but he did not allow that guilt to cause him to fall away or be paralyzed by discouragement. We can struggle with guilt too, but we can work through it and we can still move forward. And he stayed the course. He served God until his last breath and will be in God's kingdom. And the same thing we must do too. We must imitate him as a steadfast, faithful, and consistent Christian. So brethren, Saul of Tarsus, or the Apostle Paul, left us an incredible example. So let's continue imitating Paul as he imitated Christ.